All right. Well, thank you, and everyone can be seated. I'm going to pray because uh, I need to. Father, thank you so much for uh, your love, your presence, your revelation. I pray as we move through your word today that you give us clarity as to what you're saying um, and an understanding of the who you are. And um, may that understanding of who you are affect our life um, in the ways we see you, in the ways we see other people, in the ways we see your grace. I just pray that it grows us, um, grows our spiritual life, nourishes us spiritually, and we move into our Lord's Supper with a greater understanding of who you are, who died for us. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, we've been reading out of John 5, and we've covered about the first 17 verses, but I'm going to kind of go over some things with you real quick. It's been a while since we kind of laid out some of the introductions to the book, and um, it, it kind of helps us to put our feet back down on the ground when we remember sometimes that the writer of this gospel is someone who actually walked with Jesus, someone who saw his ministry, someone who, who got to see him heal these people likely, who was was in the fields that was full of grass, seeing thousands of people being fed by Jesus. This was a, a first-hand disciple, um, and Jesus calls it one of his beloved disciples. And the context is in um, a captured uh, Jewish people. Uh, these people are captured and enslaved by Rome. Uh, but the Jewish people in, in total are kind of... Um, under the authority of two different groups, both Rome and their own leadership. And we see some of their interactions with Rome kind of heat up, but most of the interactions that carry the most fire are with their own leadership. So Jesus interacts and engages this leadership. And, and this is kind of the first real big issue that we see um, come up that began to make them want to kill Jesus. Um, so this, this altercation is a big deal. Now I imagine him going in, flipping tables over and running out the money changers in the temple also upset them. But this instance here is when the, the, the shift went from persecution to murder. Where we went to, we don't want to just persecute this man, we want him dead. And, and that's a huge shift in their understanding. So um, this group had some authority to do these things. They were in control. They were being doled out favors by Rome in order to keep control of these people. So this leadership had um, authority at the heart of what they wanted to do, pride at the heart of who they thought they were, um, and a great misunderstanding of the scriptures as they move forward um, in their connection and unity with God. Uh, he's writing so that people would have life, so that people would believe in Jesus. He said, these signs I recorded um, so that you will believe. Uh, but these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And he, he, he builds this thought up as the main purpose, theme, and intent of this gospel. Uh, so when we're reading all of these miracles and inter interactions and altercations, they're supposed to point to who Jesus is, even these huge moments of conflict. Uh, so to kind of go over what's been happening so far in the beginning, uh, John 5, 1 through 9, we see the initiation of this altercation where Jesus is in complete control of what's happening here. Not only does he choose to go to Jerusalem, but he chooses to go find this man. He chooses to heal him. He chooses to tell the man to pick up his pallet and walk. That picking up the pallet and walking was ultimately what led the Jews to have an altercation with him. Um, then Jesus made sure that he went and found that same man in the temple. When the, when the Jews had first initiated their conflict with the man, he didn't even know who healed him. He couldn't even tell on Jesus if he wanted to. But Jesus is sure to go back into the temple, let him know who he is, why he healed him. He, he basically said, Sin no more so that nothing worse may happen to you. And I don't know if that comment didn't sit right with the man or what was going on with the man. We went over all those options, whether his intent was evil or, or impartial or, or completely innocent. We're not really sure, but what we do know is that because Jesus went and showed him who he was, he was able to go back and tell the Jewish leadership who healed him, who told him to pick up his pallet. The Jewish leadership wasn't really interested in who healed him. 
They were interested in he told them to break the law. They were looking at a cured man wondering about their own authority. So that that one through nine is where he tells them to pick up his pallet and, and, and sets the stage for the altercation. And then nine through 17 is when um, Jesus starts to have the altercation with the Jews that would lead to this. So they, they start having a conversation with the man, who told you to pick up your pallet? And then Jesus begins to be brought forward as the one who did it. And it says, for this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. So the persecution arose because of his Sabbath work. And what was Jesus' response to them? But he answered them, my father was working until now, and I myself am working. And this is where we left off last week. So Jesus has a couple options right now. He's being presented with breaking the Sabbath. Jesus didn't grab the Torah and go to Jeremiah and go to the law and show them why he wasn't actually breaking the law. He didn't do that. He actually makes the claim that he is working, right? So what he says is, my father was working until now, and I myself am working. And, and the Jews exploded when he said this. Why? Well, the Jews had an understanding of God being able to work all the time. God did not have to take the Sabbath off. The Sabbath was instituted because on the seventh day of creation, God did rest. But does God continue to rest on Saturday? The Jews knew this. The Jews knew that if God were to rest on Saturday, take a day off, the world would cease to exist. So there was all sorts of laws and understandings of, of why God still had to work on Sabbath. Men died, men were born. All of these things happened in which the Jews gave total credit and understanding for God to. So men dying, men living, pretty much everything that happened in the world happened on the account of God. And, and this was not just in the lives of men, but the entire world being held together. The, the Jews had an understanding that when anything happened, God was involved. And I believe that's a proper understanding. They had the understanding that he was holding all things together every day. So this would not make God guilty of sabbath breaking the jews had all kinds of weird laws they said that he didn't work all the way and, and they started to humanize god they tried to put god's restrictions of sabbath on for them onto him and, and that's what we start to do we start to why why is god allowed to work on sabbath and i'm not and that was the question that actually came to their mind um so jesus also viewed his father as always working, but he is intimately involved in that work. Um, Jesus kind of says, if God's working on Sabbath, I'm working on Sabbath. But that, that was pretty much his, his comment. But what's even more intricate about his statement is that he implies that God is working right now and I myself am working right now because of that. So he's working right at that very moment in perfect unison with the Father, was his claim. So not only is God allowed and capable of working, he's working right now, and I'm allowed and capable of working, and I am working right now. What you're accusing me of is true, but I'm not guilty because I'm God. That's what he's saying. If God can work right now, I can work right now. So what was the, the Jews' response to this? They weren't real happy, right? Said, for this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So there's this understanding and accusation that Jesus is not God. And that is an understanding and accusation that will separate you from God. That's, a, that's one of the main understandings we need to come to is that God entered the world in the flesh and gave his life for us. But Jesus' work didn't just start at that point. Jesus was intimately involved in all work that the Father has done. The Bible spells this out clearly, clearly. Um, 
Proverbs 8, 22 through 36 spells this out, but it says, When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While I had not yet made the earth and the fields, nor the first dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he was inscribed the circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when the springs of the deep became fixed, when he set for the sea its boundary, so that the water would not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the world, then I was beside him as a master workman, and I was his daily delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delights in the sons of men. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 talks about it in this way. God, after he spoke long ago in the, to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So this, this, the writer of Hebrews speaks of Jesus not just being intimately used to make all things, but he said he upholds all things by the word of his power. This is, this is the foundation and understanding of the Jews thinking that God upholds in all things by his power. That's why if God took a Saturday off, we'd be in big trouble. Because all things are being upheld by him, by his glory, by his power. That, that's the understanding of the Bible. John 1, 1 through 5 begins to paint a picture of this relationship. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and apart from him. Nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So again, we have this word existing with God and being God. These are difficult concepts. And being used to create all things and uphold all things. This is Jesus' role in creation. It's intimately tied in with the Father's role. They're not doing the same thing, but they're working on the same thing. They're perfectly united, but they have different roles. This is this is going this text here begins to really shape our understanding of the Trinity, the relationship of Father, Son, and Spirit, and how they worked eternally together to this day and will work eternally together forever. This is a, a concept that's really hard to grasp, but sadly a lot of believers think that it's 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 unattainable at any level. And that's just not true. God revealed his word to us in a way as to where we can surely begin to understand these things. Um, because we're made in his image, because we hold his spirit, because we have um, the helper. All of these things are perfectly capable of uh, for us to begin to understand, but we will never completely understand them. So in John 1, 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And, and that is kind of where we are in this story. We're at the part where Jesus has made all things, created all things, upholding all things. But now he's um, displaying this perfect glory of the Father to us. And, and that is how, as we get into this, this understanding of Jesus seeing the Father doing something and only doing the things the Father's doing, this, this, is, this is intimately tied into that relationship. He displays the glory of the Father. We're going to see a lot more how this relationship works as we move forward. So the way that Jesus said my father is also a, an interesting claim. Um, this is something that a cultural Jew or Jewish person in that time wouldn't, wouldn't say that. They'd say our father. They'd more likely refer to their father commonality in Abraham than they would God. But if they were to call God their father, it would be in a corporate way. No one would ever say my father about God. Um... But Jesus doesn't regard that. He says, for this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. 
So he says this statement, and the Jews kind of got this out of it. He said, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. He says just those words, and he's equating himself to be equal to God. Now today we can read those words and think, what are they talking about? How is, how is him saying, my father's working and I'm working, equating himself to God? Well, I think that him equating himself to being able, his excuse for being allowed to work because God is working is a clear equation to God. Okay, if God can work, I can work. If God's allowed to do it, I'm allowed to do it. But not only that, if God is working, I am working. We, we do nothing apart from each other. This is, a, this, is, this is how intimately connected they are. And the Jews would not have missed this. People today miss it all over the place. They say, Jesus never claimed to be God. <laughs> He's accused of claiming to be God right here. And all he does is turn it up. All he, he never says, I'm not God. I'm not making myself equal to God. He never says that. He says, my father is working till now and I myself am working. So what Jesus says implies his unity with the father and equality with the father. So he says, my father was working until now. And that implies he's equal with God. So his accusation, because not only he was breaking the Sabbath, that's initially what got them upset with him. The accusation grows now into not only was he breaking the Sabbath, which was punishable by death, but calling God his own father. That was how they understood him to be equating himself with God. Obviously, he made the claim that if God is working, I am working. But there's something about this claim of God being his father exclusively and independently from the relationship the Jews had with him that made them understand that he was claiming the same nature as God. So not only does God work, I work, but we share the same nature. So he just healed this man. What should the Jews be thinking of right now? We talked about this last time. He healed a man, a lame man's walking. Isaiah 35, 5 through 7. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. For waters will break forth in the wilderness and the streams in the Arabah. So we have a promise from 700 years before coming true right in front of them. This is, they were supposed to see this person who did these things and follow him. They were supposed to recognize him as their Messiah, as their king, and be obedient. And the king came and said, I'm God. And they, they love the miracles. They just don't like what he says. If, if he were to just do miracles, they'd love him. It wasn't the miracles. It was what he said on top of them. It was what the miracles were always supposed to be pointing to. They just wanted to stop and worship the miracles. They wanted what the miracles could offer them. They wanted power and, and pride within the Roman culture. They did not want a king. They did not want authority. Not really. They wanted power. And this one was calling God his own father, claiming to be God, claiming the same nature, claiming to be heir of all things through which they were promised to be heir of all things. And they just did not want it. We want the miracles. That's it. So this grievance, Jesus calling himself, um, calling God my father, would, would be a clear distinguishing characteristic from their relationship to the father. It's Jesus claiming the father's nature. It's Jesus claiming to be heir of the father. And in, and in, and in many ways, uh, like a son is the same substance of his father. It's Jesus claiming to be the same substance of his father. That's what he's doing. He's making himself equal to be God for sure. Now, God's working. I'm working. God's my father. <laughs> I'm the same substance as my father. <laughs> 
So not only is the Son in the same nature, but He's heir of all things. And through Him we're heir. We talked about this this morning. About our, our, in Romans 5. About what we, we achieve through our relationship through the one man. So what was Jesus' response? And he's about to respond to this anger that would lead to his death. If there's any time to jump out right now, is the time to do it. Right now is the time to turn back like, like um, the prophet said, or the angel said, don't worship me. Worship God alone. Now is the time to give honor to God and, and separate myself from, from, from who deserves worship and whatnot. So how does Jesus respond? <laughs> truly, truly, I say to you that the son can do nothing of himself. Unless it is something he sees the Father doing, for whatever the Father does, these things, the Son also does in like manner. So let's start off at this um, understanding that the Son can do nothing of himself. We've been talking about that. When I'm talking the Hebrews 1 through 3 and the John um, 1 through 5 and 1 14, all things being made through him and apart from him, nothing being made and him displaying the perfect glory and truth of the Father. These are them working in perfect unison together. When Jesus is working, the Father is working. And I imagine, it doesn't imply this here, but the Spirit is involved in this. If they're one being, they're moving together in this unison that I can't completely understand or show right now. But I imagine the Spirit is involved in this. I don't think that if the Father and Son can't work apart from each other, I think the Spirit is intimately involved in that, that relationship, that dynamic. So let's look at some of the ways that the, the Son and the Father are working together. Matthew eleven twenty seven, All things have been handed over to me by the Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. This is, a, this is not only does the, the Son and the Father perfectly know one another, um, but the Son reveals the Father. So we can't have the Father revealed to us apart from the Son. And in an interesting way, we can't get drawn to the Son apart from the Father. These two things are always pushing together for the same purpose and will. Though they are pushing from two different persons in this section. The Father and the Son are not the same. They are in the being God, but they are separate persons working separately within the being God. There's a command and a fulfillment. That's typically how that relationship works, but not all the time from what I've seen. But they're intimately involved in revealing each other and in, and in people being within that relationship. Matthew 16, 17, the Father reveals the Son. So we have the Son revealing the Father. Now the Father's gonna reveal the Son. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. This is when Peter starts to begin to understand who Jesus is, and he does so by the grace of the Father. And, Je and Jesus is clear with him here. So we could sit there and read these verses and say, well, who reveals who? It's impossible for anyone to be revealed to God apart from Father and Son and Spirit. That's what this is saying. It's not saying the one is doing something apart from the other one completely. It's that they work together in perfect unison to accomplish one single purpose and will. Luke 24 through four, Luke 24, 49. The son sins and fulfills the father's promise. So now his disciples are waiting. He's already resurrected. He's about to ascend. And this is what he says to him. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my father upon you. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is after they're waiting for the Holy Spirit. But Jesus says, I am sending forth the promise of my Father. So there's a, a way, an element in which Jesus is essential to delivering and fulfilling the promises of the Father. The Father promises and Jesus fulfills. And there's this interesting relationship. I'm not saying that's the law or the way it always works but it seems to be consistent with what I've seen in Scripture. John 6, 39-41 The Father wills, gives, and draws, while the Son keeps and raises. 
This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. So there's this, this beautiful relationship of father and son that has to do with the drawing, keeping, and raising of all believers. There's not a believer who's drawn, kept, and raised apart from this perfect relationship and working unity of father and son. And we know from other verses how the Spirit's working in this too. They're not working independently or apart from one another in will, in nature, in being, but they are working independently and apart from one another in person in accomplishment, in action. Again, a very big concept, but these are the verses, these are the scriptures where we are able to begin to break these things down. <laughs> so he says, the son can do nothing apart from the father. And that's where we were focused right there. The perfect unity and, and, and unification of father and son working together in nature, in being, in will, to accomplish things. But how does he do that? It says, unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. Talk about a claim to divinity. Who can see the father? <coughs> Who can see the father? John 14 through 1, 1 14 through 18. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Speaking of his pre-existence with the Father. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So we have this reality that Jesus is the way we see the display of the Father. And, and why? Because he's seen the Father. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him and he is the only one capable, able, and reliable to explain him because he is the one who has been with the Father and no one else. How do we know that? John 3.13, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus is the sole person in this time and place from this point on. God has spoken in his Son Jesus is the one who gives us information about the Father. There is no other information source about God outside of Jesus. Jesus is it. He is the perfect display of, of God. John 6, 45 through 47. Jesus sees the Father because he is from God. It is written in the prophets and they shall be taught of God. And this goes into how. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. This is our, into, if we believe Jesus came forth from the Father, and he is the sole person to give us information about the Father. Why else can Jesus see the Father? Because they are one. John 10, 24 through 33. This is another, I'm going to read this whole section because it goes to further give another instance of Jesus claiming to be divine. John 10, 24 through 33. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do, I do in my father's name. I do in my... In my father's name, they, they speak of the father. Everything about my work screams the father. These testify of me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. And no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. Why? 
My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. So, Jesus is really clear here. He has an opportunity to say, I'm not trying to make myself equal to God. I'm not, I'm not God. But what does he say? He says, not only was I with the Father, but I can do all things the Father does. And that's meant to affirm the fact that because my Father's working, I myself am also working. He says, he does things in like manner. Jesus says he can do the things God does. He says, God's working, I'm working. I see the Father because we're one. And now he's going, I do the, all the things the Father does in like manner. And we don't have to look far into Jesus' ministry to see him doing things only God can do. We have the water and the wine, the clearing of the temple, the healing of the official son from 16 miles away. We have him hearing, healing this paralytic man of 38 years. We know that he does the things that the Father does in like manner. These were all things that pointed to who he was. Not just being Messiah, but being God. This, these were things that were supposed to point to who he was. It says, For the Father loves the Son and shows them all the things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these so that you will marvel. And we're going to stop on this verse. We're only going to get to 20. We'll, we'll work our way to 24 next, next week. <clears throat> but the Father does love the Son. John 3.35 the Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. And this morning we were talking about the way in which the Father loves Jesus. And the effect that that love that the Father has for Jesus has on us. And there's a verse here, or a section of scripture that I'm going to read, and we're going to kind of hang out there for a second. John 17, 22 through 26. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, just as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and I love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundations of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. Sounds confusing. But look at it. The Father will love us if Christ is in us. That's what he's saying here. He said, and I will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. The apparent love that the father had for the son is, is, is really easy to accept. We don't have to accept too hard that the father loves the son. Sometimes it's real hard accepting that the father loves us. That's a difficult one. I know because I know myself. I know that how could a God love me? And he does so by his son and his son alone and his son exclusively. That's it. And I and them. And that's how the Father loves us. And shows him all the things that he himself is doing. This is again another huge implication to the relationship of Father to Son. There's not a human that can handle being shown all things that the Father's doing. There's not a human that could be in existence or presence of God to be shown all the things that the Father's doing. These, every single claim he makes in this section is a divine claim. Unity with the Father, seeing the Father, having information from the Father, working as the Father. Everything he's saying is making himself out to be equal to God. 
He's accused of making himself out to be equal to God. And he goes on to make myself out equal to be God rampage. He just, everything he says is, I am equal to God. I am equal to the Father. He does not run from that accusation. This is important again, because from the beginning of this story, I've been trying to paint a picture of Jesus not stumbling to the cross. Jesus is not cowering towards the cross. Jesus, he's not, you know, surprised by the cross. He built that road. He built the road to the cross. He set everything in place and in motion to get there, both before he got there and as he was stepping and moving and living. Everything he did in this situation made sure that he had this conversation, made sure that he was able to claim equality with God. Why? So that he could die. Everything he said was true. But the truth got him killed and that death earned our life. The, where we're going to end is, is the Father shows Jesus all things and the Father will show him greater works than these so that you will marvel. And this is pretty early in the ministry and Jesus is going to do some amazing things. He's going to raise the dead. He's already done some amazing things, many things that should make people marvel. But we're going to focus on the culmination of his ministry. There's one event that was meant to make people understand and believe that he was God without excuse. And that was his death. That's what he was setting the stage for. So I'm going to end with this sermon. And you're thinking, I already did that. <laughs> but in Acts 2, 14 through 28, we're going to look at the event, how this event left a mark on history. What the marvel did to even the people whom he's talking to right now. Later in the story, Peter's going to get a chance to address this group. Likely some of the same people. I'm not saying they're all the same people. But this is what happens. Right after Pentecost, we have people speaking in languages that are not their own. And we have the accusation of drunkenness come forth. And here's Peter's response. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what is spoken, is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And that shall be in the last days, God said, that I will pour my, my spirit forth on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my bond slaves, both men and women. I will in those days pour my, forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God had performed through him in your midst. So, he's talking to him. These are the guys who saw the signs. He's saying, you know he was doing miracles. Just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, this is what I'm talking about, Jesus, made the road to the cross. Predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. 
Now, we read this morning about Sheol, about the understandings, thoughts, fears, and um, thoughts that the people had on it in that day. It was death. Their understanding of being freed and the possibility of freedom from death comes from verses like this. David's claim, promise in the Messiah. What did Peter use as the ultimate thing through which the Jews would marvel? He used Christ's death and resurrection. And I think that that is that work that pointed to who he was. When he promised, he said, I will give you no sign but the sign of Jonah. Him coming out of the grave is our hope for life. That's, that's what we're doing here. That, that's why we're here. That's why we're able to see him. That's why we're able to be nourished by him. That's why we're able to find hope in prayer, in words of the Bible, when no one else seems to. It's because our life is in him, our hope is in him, and he fulfills every promise. We have so much more to talk about when it comes to this section. <laughs> I was hoping to cover more, but man, I just want to hang out here. We're going to hang out here next week too. We're going to get to 24. About Jesus claiming to be God. Because that's our, our call, is that he was God. That he died, that he rose again, and through his defeat of death, we have a hope for life. That's, it's only through him. He is our sole revelator of God. It, it's through him. It's by him we receive all information about God, all access to God. That's it. So we're going to move into Lord's Supper. And before we get there, I'm going to pray for the supper. And um, in about a halfway through, I'm going to, we're going to go over the elements again. And, and just to, to um, speak to it, we, we have Lord's Supper for any and all believers, those who call themselves believers, acceptors of God come in the flesh, sacrificing his life for their sin. That's it. You don't have to be a member of our church. I don't have any other stipulations. That's what the Bible stipulates. It also stipulates that we come in a worthy manner. And again, we're going to talk about this a little bit, but worthy does not mean worthy of grace and the cross. It means coming to the table with an understanding of our need for grace and the cross. Our, our understanding of who we are, our sin. We are to come with a clean heart. Not a perfect heart but one that's acknowledging their sin in front of God, one that's acknowledging their need of God. We're doing this to remember him. He's already saved us. We have life. So I'm going to pray and pray for the meal, and then we'll dismiss and, 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 and just gather in. We'll get food together and start talking. Um, and I would love our conversation today to be focused on Jesus being equal to God what that effect has on our life. I have a little something I want to talk about with that, but then I, I want us to talk about it. Then we're going to share the meal together. So I'm going to pray uh, for the food and, and for the meal. Father, thank you so much for this time. I pray that um, you fill the huge holes I left, Lord. Um, I pray that you teach us. pray that you grow us into a better understanding of your relationship, your being, um, both within God and to us. Uh, we need you for that. and um, But we also know that with you, uh, we can do amazing things, all things.